Who doesn't love 80s action cinema? I mean, just look at the heroes that graced the silver screen at the time. You had John Matrix, John Rambo, John McClane, and Chan Ka Koi? Hi. I've seen so many videos on YouTube where people discuss 80s action cinema but never seem to bring even the most popular Hong Kong films into the conversation. That's something I've always found mind-boggling because if you've seen these movies, you know how hard-hitting, fast-paced, and exhilarating the action was. And sure, they don't always have the rich dialogue of Raiders of the Lost Ark or the intricate character dynamics of Lethal Weapon, but when it comes to pure action filmmaking, the stuff where the actors gotta shut up and do stuff for the audience to marvel at, Hong Kong was unparalleled. So what exactly made 80s Hong Kong action cinema so damn good? It's important to note that most of these actors were skilled not only in the martial arts, but also in acrobatics since guys like Jackie Chan, Samuel Hung, Yun Biu, and many other notable Hong Kong stars were actually trained as peaking opera performers in their youths. As many of you would have guessed, the training required to get to their level of physical skill was absolutely grueling and backbreaking. And of course, the peaking opera scene was dying in the 60s and 70s. So these trained opera performers were forced to try their hands at stunt work for the early Shaw Brothers and Golden Harvest pictures. Soon enough, they would climb up the ranks from stuntmen, to actors, to action choreographers, and by the time the 80s rolled along, these guys were pulling the strings of the Hong Kong action movie industry in front of and behind the camera. And for good reason, their knowledge in martial arts and acrobatics allowed for a new type of exciting and cinematic action for the Hong Kong audience to adore post Bruce Lee. Now, let's examine what exact acting techniques these people use in their action scenes. One is exaggerated movement, where the director would often have the actors perform relatively simple movements in this grand staccato-like burst of action. This was an obvious byproduct of 70s Hong Kong action, again taking influence from the art of Peking opera. Another important thing for the actors to keep in mind is to actually sell the hits. These filmmakers really want the audience to feel the blow, and all of that impact can be stripped away if we don't even believe that these fighters are getting hurt in their physical altercations. They actually take the time to grimace when they get punched in the face, or roll over in agony after taking a nasty hit or fall. It's actually really hard to make falling look good, and the Hong Kong actors and stunt guys definitely mastered the art of falling. I mean, just look at how 80s stunt guys in America fell. <laughs> And then look at how 80s stunt guys in Hong Kong fell. Sure, one is more realistic, but the other is definitely more cinematic. Now, it's one thing to sell the hits, but it's another thing to actually want the audience to feel the blow. And this is where Hong Kong had the actors utilize movie magic for their pursuits. One technique that's ubiquitous among Hong Kong action movies is the use of power powder that really adds that extra visual layer of impact the audience enjoyed. One could do similar techniques with sweat, rice, and of course, blood. And finally, it's imperative to note that the Hong Kong way of shooting action really stressed clarity. You can see how much Hong Kong values clarity by looking at how these actors are dressed for the action sequences. The protagonist faction will always wear one style of clothing, while the antagonist faction wears a completely different style. Just look at the final fight sequence of Samuel Hung's My Lucky Stars. You don't even need to have seen this movie to know who's who, because with this image alone, we already know which party we ought to root for. Furthermore, the apparent differences between the heroes and the villains allow for a more clear and visually alluring fight scene for the audience to look at. And this brings me to the second topic of analysis. Again, it's crucial to remember that these people you see in Hong Kong action films aren't your average Joes found on the street. 
They are legitimately skilled in what they do, with years of experience under their belts. Action stars who aren't as adept in martial arts, acrobatics, or stunt work would definitely find it difficult to even make it out alive after making one of these films, because the speed, power, and pain that's demanded from the action directors is, for lack of a better phrase, absolutely bananas. So they sent me to the hospital and the doctor looked at it and he said, oh, he kicked you so hard, he split your internal ear open and there's nothing I could do about it. I can't stitch it, I can't go in. And so Steve says, okay, go back to the set. So I go back to the set, blood coming out of my face and continue the fight scene, you know, I'm going, okay, this is Hong Kong, this is what you do. Perhaps the most notable difference between American action cinema and Hong Kong action cinema is the elegance of the action choreography, where in the 80s, Hong Kong remained unmatched. If you've seen these fights, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The movements within the fights are timed to a capital T, and the choreography is so damn intricate that it makes you wonder how these action directors find the time and money to perfect these moves in the first place. Hong Kong also makes sure to have their fights tell little stories, where instead of just having two guys beat the hell out of each other until some winner comes out on top, you get little wins and little losses from both opponents, including some time to breathe in between for not just the opponents, but the audience as well. This back and forth tugging of wins and losses keeps the viewers on their toes because they too are tugged along for the nail biting ride. These fights also seem to strike the perfect balance between legitimate fighting, which can get rather ugly and uncinematic, and operatic non-realism, which is pretty but ends up feeling like a dance rather than a fight. The end result of this blend is magical, because you often have the legit jabs, blocks, bobs, and grapples for an MMA match but still retain that cha-cha 1-2-3 rhythm for a dance number. The Hong Kong tempo is actually quite fast. The blows per second rate is easily the highest among all the other fighting movie markets around the world. But despite the insane speed of the moves shared by the opponents, these action directors still manage to keep every hit, block, and dodge precise and clear enough for the camera to see. And as if getting these hits precise wasn't intense enough, Hong Kong action directors also make sure to actually have these actors hit each other. No, I don't mean actual UFC knuckle sandwiches to the face, though hits like that do happen from time to time. I'm referring to the manner in which they block each other's attacks. These actors are legitimately stopping full force punches and kicks with their often non-padded arms. And it definitely doesn't seem like a pleasant experience. Every day after shooting, I had to have a medical treatment for my both arms because the movers were very difficult and I didn't have enough uh, experience while that time. So every shot took so many takes until director say cut, okay, then. And on the topic of unpleasant experiences, let's talk about the notorious Hong Kong stunts. In case you didn't know, Jackie Chan was not the only Hong Kong stunt guy, as there was a whole industry full of these people in Hong Kong who were willing to put their lives on the line for the audience's entertainment. And sure, Jackie did the wildest and most iconic stunts, but with the lack of CGI in 80s Hong Kong, no one was safe. Male fighters, female fighters, men and women who aren't even action stars, Hell, why not bring children into the mix too? I would also like to stress that these stunt guys weren't just daredevils who fell from high places without any care for their lives. These guys not only used pads, but they also had excellent body control and landing techniques that saved them from rather fatal consequences. Safety was still first for Hong Kong, but as you know, there's a reason why you don't see these sort of stunts in movies anymore. No matter how much padding you have on, you need balls made of titanium to take this fall. Ouch. One quirk of 80s Hong Kong action cinema was the wide lens, which was used to capture every inch of action needed for the audience to enjoy. Sometimes you'll even find the wide lens distorting the frame to magnify the action that takes place in its center like making an overhead shot of a kick twice as powerful or making a pistol look like a comic book hand cannon. The Hong Kong way of shooting action also took advantage of the space within the frame the action was captured. 
The actual blocking of the action is very dynamic, as it oftentimes utilizes the depth of the action space by having the action occur in the background and the foreground. This was revolutionary for Hong Kong, because if you've seen movies like Drunken Master or Five Deadly Venoms, you know that 70s Hong Kong action was shot in a more two-dimensional fashion that rarely ever let the audience get into the fighting ring themselves. Using zooms timed on action and having subjects literally pop in and out of the frame were other trademarks of Hong Kong action cinema, as they allowed for a more jolting and kinetic spice for the action taking place in the frame. The thing people praise the most about Hong Kong action cinema though, is how they keep the camera steady to let the audience just see the action. And of course, Hong Kong is worthy of that praise because, as a result, we get to see the already amazing action set pieces very clearly. But it's also worthy to note that when Hong Kong moved the camera and varied the shots, they did it right. A lot of times, you'd find the camera laterally tracked to capture action by following one opponent overpowering another, providing this suffocating sensation similar to Ken cornering your ass in Street Fighter 2. The actual varying of camera shots and angles is another notable asset of Hong Kong action filmmaking. In general, when you want to film fights and actually get the audience as close to the fight as possible, then you shoot as close as possible. The basic formula is to shoot wide when the guys are using the full range of their entire body to fight, shoot medium when the guys are punching, and shoot close when guys are being strangled or when you really want the audience to see the impact of a punch or a kick. This formula is effective and can be seen in world action cinema as a whole. But Hong Kong decided to take this a step further by getting creative with the placement of the camera. You've got fights like the factory scene from Dragons Forever where I saw high angle shots, low angle shots, badass overhead slow-mo shots, and I don't even know what to call this transition. This variation of shots, angles, and perspectives all the while keeping the action clear and rarely moving the camera makes these stunts and fights all the more sleek and fun to watch. The big question pretty much every film editor has to tackle is, when should I cut? Perhaps you could just go with your gut and cut when it feels quote unquote right. But editing action is tricky. Action scenes deal with movement, emotion, violence, and tension all in one frame. So you can't really say there's one way to edit fights. In the 70s, the generic Hong Kong way was this. Our fighters would exchange 10 to 20 blows in two or three shots before someone gets hit. And right before or after that person gets hit, you cut and do it all over again. This alongside with the meaty sound effects really stressed the operatic rhythm the Hong Kong action directors wanted to showcase back then. Now look at how America edited fight scenes in the early to mid 2010s. Okay, 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 but you get the point. There really are so many approaches to editing fight scenes. The 1980s Hong Kong approach is in fact very similar to the 1970s Hong Kong approach, but with many more editing renovations added on to it. The 1980s Hong Kong action directors would also hold the shot to maintain the rhythm found in the fight, just like 1970s Hong Kong. But this time, you find a lot more fluid cuts on movement, whether it be to see the fight from a different angle, or to set up a scene for an awesome slow-mo kick. For 80s Hong Kong, cuts aren't just about rhythm. It's about involving the audience and bringing them into the fighting ring to make sure they aren't bored. And this basically shattered the editing norm set by 1970s Hong Kong. So here's a list of very effective and unique edits that I will name myself since I don't know if there are professional terms to use for these edits in the first place that I find pretty often in 1980s Hong Kong action cinema. First, there's what I call the power cut, where you begin in a wide shot where some opponent is about to hit their enemy, but you cut right when that opponent is about to make contact with the enemy. Then in the next shot, you don't match continuity, as the opponent has his blow pulled all the way back again, and from here, you carry on the motion until the enemy gets hit. The end result is fantastic, because your brain registers this as one powerful shot. So the continuity error is not only unnoticeable, but it's also ironically benefiting your action. Then there's the shock cut, where you let the opponent hit the enemy in one shot, but have the following shot be the unexpectedly huge after effect of the blow. These cuts are so effective because you can't guess what the victim's reaction will be until the film cuts and reveals the surprise for you. 
You also don't even need to wait for the hit to cut. Sometimes cutting right before the hit will get the job done as well. A scene like this could have easily been done in one shot. But it's the shock cut that really leaves the viewer, well, shocked. We let the film hold our hand in the long take, and then the cut gives us no time to register the setting around Jackie. And once he gets his head slammed against the glass, it's too late to take time to process what in the world just happened, and all we can do is grimace with him. The use of slow motion also evolved in 1980s Hong Kong, where initially in the 70s, the most common slow-mo edit was the classic shot of someone about to hit a guy, and then having that someone hit the guy, and then you see the guy's reaction to the hit. Fast forward to 1980s Hong Kong, and you'll notice that these guys get a lot more creative with slow motion editing. So here's a montage of different kinds of slow-mo edits that are commonly found among these 80s Hong Kong action movies. The final editing technique I would like to touch on is the way Hong Kong handled fast pace editing. After watching a movie like, say, Taken 3, fast pace editing is probably the last thing you want to hear an action film associated with. However, when done correctly, fast pace editing can be a very effective tool that can help electrify the action for the viewer. For Hong Kong, the key was to not cut on action. Just allow the barrage of quick shots convey the sense of speed and fury needed without getting the audience confused about what they're looking at. Take this very quick scene from Sammo Hung's Winners and Sinners. That clip was 3.88 seconds, and it had three cuts, with each shot running 1.50 seconds, 0.50 seconds, 0.30 seconds, and 1.58 seconds in that order. And yeah, it honestly does sound like a mess on paper. But let's actually break this scene down and understand why it works. The first shot is a shot of our bad guy reaching for his gun. Then the camera zooms out to dynamically reveal the gun, only for the gun to be smacked out of his hand. End of action. The next shot has Sammo Hunk spiking the bad guy in the stomach with his pole, leaving our bad guy no choice but to pop into the center of the frame to wince in pain. End of action. The next shot is Sammo kicking the bad guy's gun out of sight. End of action. And finally, the last shot is Sammo whacking the bad guy upside the head with the pole, resulting in him being violently slammed into the powder bags and falling onto the floor to miserably wallow in agony. End of action. All four shots end with a stoppage of action, so there's no action for the editor to cut on. This as well as the lack of camera movement allows for something that could have looked like this actually end up looking more polished because everything on screen is clear. Quick cuts on movement is very dangerous because cutting means that we have a new shot to focus on and therefore a new place on the frame to look at. But if this is the continuation of the action we were watching before and we don't get enough time to gather ourselves after the new cut to find the place on the frame where we should focus on, then we lose information in time and we as an audience will suffer from confusion. Add some camera shakes and now the audience has to go to their personal eye doctor. Hong Kong action directors wanted their audience to shut off their brains and enjoy the action. So the last thing they wanted was their audience to be confused or eye traumatized. As a result, they made sure to be very careful with fast paced cutting so that we can not only keep up with what's going on, but also feel the impact of the action being displayed. It's 
an understatement to simply say that Hong Kong knew their stuff when it came to making good action. Hong Kong was full of absolute masters of their craft, who went above and beyond to make the most entertaining and heart-stopping action for their local audiences. Now while I do think Hong Kong is superior at choreographing, shooting, and editing fight scenes, let me also make clear that this isn't a video bashing American action movies. I adore 80s American action cinema, as they have multiple strengths that I simply won't cover on this channel because I'm a weeb. Hell, even modern American action movies are getting better by the year, as John Wick and Ethan Hunt are consistently showing us the most beautiful action sequences America's seen in years. And if you look closely, you'll see that they probably took some notes from Hong Kong action filmmaking as well. If you haven't seen any of these 80s Hong Kong action movies or fight scenes, do yourself a favor and check them out. They are truly one of its kind when it comes to action filmmaking, and they are definitely something you'll never see be made again in the future. And if you still don't think 80s Hong Kong action cinema is worth your time, then hopefully this scene will change your mind. Yeah.